the Olympic Mount at the northwest corner of the United States is a series of ranges covering the heart of some three million acres comprising the Olympic Peninsula. Bordered on the west by the Pacific Ocean and separated from the developed areas of the state of Washington by Puget Sound, it is one of a few surviving pockets of true wilderness. This is some of the route we will travel later on foot with Herb Chrysler. As he recalls his 50 years in the Olympics, we'll flash back to scenes he filmed of his life while documenting the wild. We hope that you will allow for the fact that parts of our work print is from vintage color stocks yet to be corrected. Visual effects will be added along with improved sound and narration. The purpose of the production may not be evident from this sample reel. It is simply to convey an expression of hope that the delicate balance of nature will be better understood, that the wilderness may survive. Chrysler has a lot to remember. As a wildlife photographer, his adventures cover a span of over 50 years. He recalls one experience which took place here at Hurricane Ridge in 1942. Uh, this is the place where you came up here in the winter time. Right up here is where the lookout was. We were aircraft warning. Uh, people here during the war. This was uh, above the clouds, and this was the highest peak where there were a place that we could stay, and we were there nine months in the winter. Mr. Chrysler and his wife Lois were on duty around the clock. The tiny cabin required constant attention. Only 12 feet square, it was built as a fire lookout for summer use. It was fastened to the highest peak by steel cables. Safety cables were stretched from heavy posts to the doorway. Coal had to be brought up from a storage shed below the cabin. Chris was not only a good cook, but also a gardener. And he grew some vegetables in a spare bunk, along with a few house plants. Month after month, the snow piled deeper and deeper, their only water supply. And it took a lot of melted snow just to do the dishes. But, as it always does, spring at last arrived. And the Chryslers met some friends. feet of motion pictures and uh, using Hume's Ranch as your base, is that it? Yes, that's right. And uh, in the last two years, we uh, photographed the uh, World Business True Life Adventure Series. The Olympic Elk. The Olympic Elk, yeah. <laughs> 
For 10 years, the Chryslers lived in the old Humes Ranch cabin, which is now a registered historic site. When they first moved here, there were a lot of animals. There was a family of skunks living under a house. And <clears throat> they had a sign on this tree, please don't disturb the skunks. If you do, we probably would have to move. And the skunks would come out and we could feed them. They'd come out, I'll show you where they came out from under the house. They'd come out here, three or four of them, and if there's any strangers come around, why, they'd raise the tail, and we'd say, don't bother them, they're a whole set for a shot. <clears throat> then they, we had bear. The bear would get up uh, apple trees, and they'd uh, eat the apples. They, now, this is a fine apple tree that's a gravel stain. It's about the best apple for making cider. And these were big, and, and uh, the uh, bear discovered it was good, too. So they'd climb up in here and break the lambs and eat the apples. And, and I didn't mind dividing with them, but I thought we weren't going to have any. So I put a cross-cut saw nailed it to there, and they couldn't climb up there anymore. So we got our apples that way. Uh, <coughs> The cabin was three and a half miles from the end of the nearest road, so everything had to be carried in, mostly by packboard. as many chores. There was no plumbing. And there was no electricity. It was 1943, but they lived just as the pioneers had lived here 50 years before. garden was essential, but first a strong fence was needed to keep the deer and elk from browsing on the young plants. The following year, there was plenty, with some to store for the winter. This is the El War River. The elk crosses here, sometimes large herds. In the spring, there's the calves, and they struggle sometimes to wash down the river a few ways. When we first came up here, there were good fishing. They could always uh, get a mess of fish, three or four for breakfast every morning. After visits to old friends and familiar places, Chrysler now begins his 1973 traverse of the Olympic Mountains. A group of eight, with film, equipment, and supplies to last 30 days, will follow Chrysler beyond the trails, across the wilderness he has known and loved for half a century. In 1938, Chris and I followed this same route in making our first film. We were the entire crew 
and cast. So for some action, Chris starts the camera, and as I cross, he circles around and comes into the picture. I exit to turn the camera off. Film was scarce in those days. has changed in 40 years, and so have we. But the tree is still there, so we cross it again. This time, without packs. We will make a high traverse above the timber but below the snow fields and glaciers. The end of our first day is the last of the trail. We have reached the 5,000 foot elevation and we start across the first of a series of mountain ranges. Chris points to a steep slope where we once located a large herd of elk. But the lookouts saw us too and sounded the alarm. It took us two hours to cross the same slope in 1973. Across the pass, we drop down to Cat Creek Basin, one of Chrysler's favorite campsites. There's a shelter here, which he started in 1938. Years later, it became known as Hot Cake Camp, when Chris packed in an 80-pound iron stovetop and established a tradition. In the old days, I was the dishwasher. Forty years later, same job. We used the original camp as a base in making the first color film of the Olympic National Park, the year it was established. Chrysler's long experience in the area was an advantage in locating wildlife. He had a way with animals that left them undisturbed. He understood the wild and the laws of nature. But this trip for me is nearly over. Chrysler has decided to go on to look for elk. I'll go north to the trail. Chrysler, with food enough to last a week, will go south across the mountains in time he finds the elk, young bulls looking for mates, herd bulls protecting their families. Cows move into the timber. And from this beginning, Chris resolved to document the entire life cycle of the Olympic elk. It would take 10 years of effort. 
And luckily, he could not foresee the difficult times ahead. The first long years of struggle had already begun. Deep in the wilderness, beyond any trail for help, he made a small mistake. He slipped, fell over a cliff onto rocks, into a stream bed. An ankle sprained, one arm and hand broken. He made splints, set the arm, tied it with strips of a flour sack, and managed with one hand. Adding a hook stick to the bindings helped in setting up the tripod and camera and in many other ways. But now his food supply is nearly gone. He must move on. He decides to risk crossing a large glacier to save the several days he'd lose in going around it. Without ice climbing gear, he must chop every footstep. Water running over the ice adds to the danger. One slip into a crevasse would be the end. Leaving his camera running, he must make three trips. One to chop his way across, second, to get his pack, and third, to bring the camera. He gives thanks for being allowed to cross. We passed by the glacier he survived so many years ago, and for 30 days, we follow Chrysler at his pace as he recalls a lifetime of photography mixed with adventure. And there is much we can learn from what he has seen and heard and felt in the Olympic wilderness.